On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm pleased to welcome Christian Lander, here to discuss Whiter Shades of Pale, the stuff white people like, coast to coast, from Seattle's sweaters to Maine's microbrews. Whiter Shades of Pale is Christian Lander's follow-up to Stuff White People Like, a guide to the unique taste of millions, and takes his deft exploration of the socially conscious Caucasian bohemian hipster on a cross-country tour from Boston to Boulder to Santa Fe. Three years ago, Christian Lander was an internet copywriter in Culver City, California, and then he started a blog. At first, in January 2008, StuffWhitePeopleLike.com got a couple hundred hits a day, by the end of March, it had amassed over 20 million. By July, he had published his first book, which quickly became a New York Times bestseller. That summer, he really hit it big and kicked off his book tour at Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> in a recent review of Whiter Shades of Pale, the New York Times praised, few people alive are as deft at this satire as is Mr. Lander. His books are painfully observant, and they take you places that The Daily Show and The Onion, those reliable dispensers of elite, of elite wit, mostly don't. We are very pleased to bring him back to Harvard Bookstore. Please join me in welcoming Christian Lander. Thanks, everybody, for coming out on an afternoon. Um, this is great. That review in the New York Times, actually, if you want to read it, I have the whole thing tattooed on my back. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of a surprise, but no, this was the first bookstore where I, I ever had a, an author event, and I, I remember it really vividly because I got here way too early, and I was super nervous, and so I walked around the bookstore, and then I waited outside on the corner, and someone recognized me, and it was the first time anyone ever recognized me, and so it was like the greatest day ever. <laughs> but the funny thing about Harvard as well, not only was it the first place where I, where I actually had, uh, you know, I talked to an audience, but... Uh, People always ask me, like, well, when you do these book signings and these book readings, does anyone just not get it and sort of attack you and sort of, you know, go at you? And I'm like, no, 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 never, never. Well, except for one time. <laughs> of course it was here. And <laughs> I just got through it, you know what I mean? Like, I had been freaking out about actually doing this talk, and I was so nervous, and I got to the end of it, and I was like, whew. And I look over, I'm like, question? It's like, yeah, what are you really doing about racism? And I was like, oh, <laughs> Could you just let me off the hook? Like, this took a lot of work. Um, but that was the closest one I've had, at least in person. And I'll get into some of the and not in-person stuff that's happened since then. So the, the, the new book uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit. But I think part of the interesting story about everything is the, the rags-to-riches writer story that I have. And the last time I was here, uh, we've sort of been filled in, was the, was the summer of 08. So the thing that I'd started in January, become a bestseller by July. And every day of my life in that time, I kept saying, you know, this can never get bigger. This can never get bigger. And then each day kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And in the past couple of years, some things have happened that actually made it get bigger and have been a little weird and awesome. So after I was done here, did a couple more cities, and then in August 2008, after, you know, not believing I was able to do this tour or write this book, it was incredible. In August of 2008, um, my publisher got a call from Late Night with Conan O'Brien saying that they wanted me to be a guest on the show. This was an enormous deal for me. Like, I was absolutely freaking out. I could not believe this was going to happen. Um, it, was, it was a huge deal because I, I, I love Conan O'Brien, which I guess all white people do as he's an entry in the new book. Um, uh, you, would, you would think that I may not like him because I have a personal vendetta against men who are taller than me, uh, just because I think they've had an easier life than me. But he does get a pass on that policy because he has red hair, and he knows the pain that we went through as children. Uh, for those of you who inflicted that pain, yes, we do have souls. And no, we did not appreciate the nursery rhymes about the color of our pubic hair. So anyways, he can relate to the problems that I've had in my life. So I was very, very excited to go on this show. So they say, yeah, Christian, September 8th, so, sorry, September 6, 2008, you are officially going to be a guest on Late Night with Conan O'Brien. And I cannot believe this. Like, I'm actually going to be a guest on Late Night with Conan O'Brien. And so I did what any normal person would do when you find out you're going to be on one of these shows. I immediately went to NBC.com and I hit refresh a million times until I could find out who the real celebrities were going to be on the show. And so, you know, it's a Friday show, so it could be anybody, like a big movie star or like an athlete or who knows. So refresh, 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 refresh. Can't wait, can't wait, can't wait. And it finally comes back that the other celebrity on the show that night is going to be Jerry O'Connell. Now, this, did someone awe out of disappointment in that one? Like, quite the opposite for me, in fact, because I was very excited about this for, for a couple of reasons. The first of which, uh, I'm Canadian, and he's an American, but he was on a Canadian TV show when I was growing up called My Secret Identity. 
And it was a very terrible show, but I loved it as a kid, so I was excited to meet him for that. But more importantly, he was uh, in the movie Stand By Me, based on the Stephen King book. And in that, in that movie, he was about 12, and he was fat. And he grew up to be this really good-looking guy with, like, a six-pack, and he married a Sports Illustrated swimsuit model. Now, I was a fat kid. And so Jerry O'Connell is literally a hero to every fat kid across the world because he looked like that at 12 and grew up to marry a swimsuit model. So he is literally my fat kid hero. And I am so excited to get to meet him. And the other guest was uh, Tim Gunn from Project Runway. So... <laughs> I'm just like so excited about meeting Jerry O'Connell and just like just hearing stories about you know how he lost weight and everything and like I can't wait. So I get to New York and I'm in my dressing room and my dressing room is very very small and I'm very very nervous. I've, I've never been on a show like this before. I'm just I'm freaking out and I vividly remember being in this little dressing room and in front of me was a plate of cookies and I remember saying to myself, "Don't eat them, you're gonna throw up. Don't eat them, you're gonna throw up." But fat kid instinct, right? So I start reaching for the cookie and I'm like, "No no 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 no, I'm not I'm not gonna do it." So I'm just I'm focusing on just staying calm but I don't know what the etiquette is back here. Like, I've never been on one of these shows before. I don't know what the rules are. Like, can you go to the other dressing rooms? And I start thinking, like, what would I do? And I, I'd probably be super awkward and, like, knock on Jerry's door and be like, hey, 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 Jerry, uh, remember when you were a fat kid? Yeah, <laughs> right? And, you know, and then he would go on the show later and be like, yeah, Conan, there's a weird guy obsessed with fat kids backstage. Like, <laughs> so I'm like, I'm just going to pretend like I've been here before and not talk to anybody and just try and just, just pretend like I'm a professional. And so I'm in the dressing room. And I'm in there with my agent, and my agent kind of looks a bit like me, except he's this tall, <laughs> so I can trust him. Um, and he's like, look, man, you're going to be fine. You've got this. Do not worry. You're going to be fine. You're not going to throw up. Everything's going to be all right. And I'm like, okay, 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 I think I can do this. And I'm just focusing, I'm focusing, and there's a knock on my door. And I look over, and it's Jerry O'Connell. <laughs> and he points right to my agent. He's like, are you the guy? Are you the other guy? Are you the stuff white people like guy? My agent slowly points up to me. And I'm about to open my mouth to talk about how much I've appreciated his career as an actor. And he goes, <gasps> Oh my god, I read that website all the time. It's so funny. Everything you write, this is great. And I'm like, you get in sliders. You get, bleh. and he just won't stop talking about how great it is. He's like, oh, it's so incredible. It's so funny. Listen, man, when the show's over, you need to stick around. There's a couple people I want you to meet. I gotta go out there. All right, bye. See you later. <laughs> Gone. And I look at my agent. I'm like, I think I just met Jerry O'Connell. And he's like, yeah, and I think he liked you. Uh, so I'm just, I'm free. I'm like, wow, that was that was odd and awesome. So I go on the show. I go on Conan O'Brien. I'm waiting backstage. You know, Jerry goes out there. He's hilarious. Tim Gunn goes out there. He's great. Now it's my turn to go out there. Now, everything I tell you about this part of the story is recreated from the T-Vote episode because I blacked out the whole time I was on there. I don't remember any of this happening. So I go out on the show, and the way it's all lined up is you have Conan here, you know, here, and then you have me here, and then Tim Gunn's here, and then Jerry O'Connell's on the end. This layout is going to be very important as the story goes on. And so, you know, Conan, I'm nervous. He asked me the first question. He's like, well, Christian, you know, for those of people who aren't familiar with your, with your site or your book, what are some things white people like? And I decide to go with an old standby. And I'm like, well, you know, Conan, uh, farmer's markets. Right? And Conan's like, yeah, I guess we do. And Tim Gunn's like, yeah, I suppose. And Jerry O'Connell's like, oh, my God. That's where I buy my carrots. And he's just like, he's just dying with laughter. I'm like, this is going great. And then, uh, and then, you know, so I'm like, I'm loosening up, and you can just see myself getting calmer. And then Conan's like, well, Christian, you know, we have Tim Gunn on the show tonight. What are some clothes that white people like? And I'm about to open my mouth, and I'm wearing a cardigan, as I want to do as a white person. And I'm about to open my mouth to, to, to say something, and I feel a hand on my arm pinching me. And I look left, and Jerry O'Connell has reached over Tim Gunn and is pinching my cardigan, going, sweaters, white people like sweaters. <laughs> Say sweaters. <laughs> and like, I, I want to believe, you know, that I'm a pretty cool customer, right? And I can just look at my fat kid hero pinching me on Late Night with Conan O'Brien over a reality television superstar and just be like, oh yeah, Jerry's right, we like sweaters. Yeah. No, I freak out. You just you see it in my face, I'm like, Um, shorts? <laughs> and Jerry hits the floor. <laughs> we wear them too early. <laughs> I just died, and I'm like, man, this interview's going great. And then I look at Tim Gunn, and I'm like, maybe not that great. And then, um, and so I finish the interview, and I'm done with the show, and this is just the most amazing thing ever. And I'm backstage, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I done it. I, you know, like... Six days before my 30th birthday, I have been on Late Night with Conan O'Brien. Man, I really, really need to call some ex-girlfriends. 
Because I'll tell you, no matter what any artist, musician, or writer ever says, the number one motivation is just sticking it to ex-girlfriends. So I take my phone out and I'm trying to remember her number and, uh, and I hear, Christian, Christian. I'm like, oh, oh, okay, I, I turn around. It's Jerry O'Connell again. And he's like, yeah, man, here's those people I want you to meet. And I'm like, oh, all right. And he goes, yeah, it's my parents. <laughs> I, I'm sort of thinking to myself, I'm like, yeah, Jerry, I don't think our uh, relationship has progressed to this stage just yet. But there he is, and I'm backstage with his parents, just hanging out, you know, and he gets a phone call, and then I have this really awkward talk with them for a few minutes, and he comes back, and he's like, oh, man, hilarious, hilarious. You live in L.A., right? And I'm like, yeah, I, li I live in Los Angeles. He's like, listen, man, let me get all your information. When we get back, we should, uh, you know, all go out to dinner. And I think to myself, sure thing, Jerry, because I know this dinner is never, ever, ever going to happen. Not because Jerry doesn't want it to happen. I think it's quite clear he definitely wants it to happen, but because I have this nightmare. And I remind you, Jerry O'Connell, very good-looking guy, married to Rebecca Romaine, who was, you know, an X-Men and a swimsuit model. And then I'm, I'm me. And I'm my wife, she's, she's very pretty, but she's, she's about this tall. Again, so I can trust her. And she has sort of reddish hair and, you know, kind of pale skin. And I just have this fear that we're going out to dinner. And then three weeks later, I'm going to be looking at Us Weekly. And there's going to be a picture of all of us with the caption, Jerry and Rebecca participate in the couples edition of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. <laughs> And I know I'll never, ever recover from that. You know, like letters to the editor, I don't have cancer. Uh, so I, I figure it's done. I've, I've left New York. I'm back in Los Angeles. I'm like, I've, I've done it. This is, this is incredible. And then a couple weeks later, I get invited to go on the, uh, later with Carson Daly, the one that's on at 2 in the morning. And again, I go back to NBC, and I hit refresh a thousand times to find out who the real celebrities were going to be, and I was surprised to find that it was me. Um, and so I, go on the sh so I go on the show, and I'm in my dressing room, and I'm, I'm really relaxed this time. I'm not freaking out. And then I look at the wall of my dressing room, and I have to squint for a second because there's a picture of Jerry O'Connell... <laughs> on the wall. He's singing for some reason, whatever. And my wife looks at me and she's like, look, man, you have got to send him an email. You are never going to find another non-weird opportunity to send him an email. Do it. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. So I take my phone out and I write him like, hey, Jerry, uh, it's Christian. I don't know if you remember me. Uh, I was on Conan O'Brien with you a couple weeks ago. Anyways, I'm going to be on Carson Daly tonight and I'm backstage in the dressing room and there's a picture of you in here. Thought it was kind of funny. Christian, send. Boop. Awesome. I'm T-boying it right now. Jerry. <laughs> And so you got to remember, this is like September 08, nine months ago. I was literally dicking around on the internet with my friend Miles. And now I'm looking at my phone being like, I think I have to get a restraining order against my fat kid hero. <laughs> Things can change pretty fast. And so I just, I, I, cu I couldn't believe it. It was, it, was, it was amazing. And so that was still 08. And then we kept going and the book has actually done, the first book did really well. So the book was published in Australia where it was a bestseller. It was published in the UK and it did really well. Believe it or not, they have an amazing amount of white people in both places. <laughs> the book was translated into Dutch, and the Dutch are incredible. So the first book is similar looking to this one, where there's a big thumbs up on it, which I refer to as the white gang sign. That's how, that's how we recognize each other. It's like, yeah, yeah. Um, but instead of putting that on their cover of Stufen Witten people looking, uh, um, my Dutch has faded since college, um, they put a mirror on the front of it. So when you hold it up, you're like, aww. Aww, you know. So very, very clever, very clever people. Um, and this year, this is officially happening. This is, this is 100%. It just took a really long time to do. The book is being translated into Japanese. Uh, it took a really long time because there's like a ton of footnotes explaining sort of the sarcasm and the satire and everything like that. But still, it is actually happening, and I have this fantasy every single day that the book is going to be used as a textbook in Japan <laughs> for, like, business English, you know what I mean, and all those courses. And I just dream that I'll be in Los Angeles, and I'll be going past LAX, and I'll see all these Japanese businessmen coming out of the Tom Bradley terminal wearing, like, Fleet Foxes t-shirts, <laughs> like Florence and the Machine, you know what I mean, and be like, what is uh, organic coffee? <laughs> and then during the meeting, they flip through the book, and they're like, oh, Trader Joe's? <laughs> It's like, I was just shopping there this morning. Uh, frisbee sports? Yeah, I'm on an ultimate team. And then, like, I create a trade imbalance between the two countries somehow. So that is, that is the fantasy that would, that, that would take place that would be absolutely incredible. And then last year, a really interesting thing happened. Um, Stuff White People Like, the first book, was optioned by Imagine Entertainment to become a TV show. And they were the same people who did Arrested Development. And so we went into work developing a TV show, and it was great. The concept of the show was the wrong kind of white guy learning how to be the right kind of white guy from a black guy. 
And they all worked at like a Burt's Bees company, you know, with the tagline, saving the world through vanity. And, and it, you know, I worked with a really amazing director and the producer and everyone was great and it was, it was really funny. And, you know, it was, it was really funny for me, especially to write about um, the idea of a black guy giving advice about white people. Because when I first started the blog, so many people thought that I was a black guy who went to Harvard. And they were like, wow, I'm really disappointed to find out you're a white Canadian. And I want to write back, I'm like, yeah, welcome to me at 13. Um, so anyways, we wrote this show, and it was really funny, and we, you know, we submitted it to the network, and they're like, yeah, great, uh, we're going to do a show about a brewery. All right, bye-bye, click, done, show died completely. So it was fun to get to write it, and it would have been amazing if it happened, but that's just how TV works, and it's fine. By far, it was not the biggest heartbreak of the last year. The biggest heartbreak of the last year actually happened um, through no fault of her own, but by uh, Oprah Winfrey. Yes, the, the, the very same. So I got a call, again, from Random House, and they said, Christian, um, Oprah's doing a show called Things That Make Me Laugh, and uh, they want to talk about your book on the show. And I am freaking out. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to get to buy a house in California. This is going to be incredible. This is going to change everything. I'm not going to be like friends, and I'm going to take that sticker if they'll let me put it on. It would be the greatest thing of my life. And it's like, not, not only will be, there be that, but it's like, like, as a white person, the, the stamp of approval from Oprah is, like, one of the best, you know? It's like, if I could somehow get a tattoo where she says, like, one of the good ones, Oprah, and I could put it here, oh, it would, like, it would make my day. Like, I get an Obama one here and then an Oprah one there, and I would be set forever. So, so thrilled about this. They're like, yeah, they, they got the legal to show the cover. Uh, we sent a whole box of books over to the studio. Like, it's, it's really going to happen. I'm like, oh, my God. And so, having used to, like, not having it taken away from me when I went on Conan or Carson Daly, I'm like, start calling people. I'm like, yeah, the book's going to be on Oprah. I'm freaking Oprah. Yeah, that Oprah. And, uh, and so, the show's all set to air. I've got the TV all lined up. I'm super, super excited. Literally five minutes before the show airs. Call. Hi. Uh, yeah, Christian. Um, so, good news. Oh, they love the book. Um, and they talked about it on the show, and I'm like, yes, three bedroom, and um, and then they say, yeah, but the problem is they uh, they talked about it for about 20 minutes, and the way TV works is if you, it's kind of a segment that runs that long, you either have to run all of it or none of it, and they're gonna run uh, none of it, so um, sorry, and then you know all the dreams come down, but I'm still watching the show. I'm like, no, she was wrong. That she was wrong. There's no way they couldn't talk about this book, and so the guests that day were uh, Dane Cook, Monique, and George Lopez. And so, you know, I'm like, they have to talk about the book in here. They need to fill it out. You know, it was, come on, come on. So I'm watching it. I'm watching it. Nothing, 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 nothing. And then towards the end, something interesting happens. Um, for whatever reason, I can't remember what they were talking about. Monique decides that she's going to start doing these squats and walk into the audience. I can't remember where the story was before. <laughs> I just remember seeing Monique squatting in the Oprah audience. And then George Lopez wants to show up, I suppose, so there was perfume nearby for some reason. He just walks in spraying the perfume. And Dane Cook is like, I'm not really gonna do any of this stuff. He doesn't know what to do, so he's like super awkward on stage. So he reaches over and starts flipping through my book on stage. And so I'm now watching my book like three feet from Oprah's head, and I'm just screaming at the TV. I'm like, ask him about the book! <laughs> And so for like three months, my Facebook picture was the book next to Oprah's head. Like, I took a picture of my TV screen. And so, no, they didn't ask about the book. They just cut the commercial. And then that day, later on, I went to Oprah.com into the forums. And I was like, hey, does anyone know what book that was that Dane Cook was holding up? <laughs> Oprah seemed to think it was really funny. And then, like, I hit refresh. Again, no responses. The one below me was like, isn't Monique funny? 10,000 responses. <laughs> and so I just... Um, so I just had to let that dream go. And so it, it, it completely evaporated. But, you know, no fault of her own. She likes the show. I guess I will have to live, you know, just knowing that. And then, uh, I, you know, I was able to do book tours and college lecture tours throughout the U.S. And I was able to do all this research, continued research on white people. And I found a number of sort of these small super dif superficial differences between each town. And I wanted to get to write another book, and Random House was nice enough to let me write another one. And so as I was going through it, um, I tried to figure out what made a white city. I was like, what, what do I define as a white city? And I realized it was anywhere that I want to live and I can't afford. <laughs> that pretty much summed it up. Portland, Oregon, Seattle, you know, Santa Fe, Los Angeles, Brooklyn, Boston, and so forth. So that was how I decided, you know, any place where um, property values outstrip incomes. And that's, that's a white city. 
And I was hoping in the process of writing it that maybe it would work like a therapy for me. Like, I thought, you know, I'm over 30 now. Like, maybe I can let go of some of the snobbery. Maybe I can be a better man. Like, maybe by writing this and pointing it out, I can realize that, yes, you can still be a good person and listen to the Dave Matthews Band. Like, maybe I can... <laughs> Maybe I can do that, right? Maybe I'll be less judgmental about everything. Maybe I, maybe I, won't, I won't be so awful. And I always like to make this joke that as a white person, you know, we'd rather have you look through our medicine cabinet than our bookshelf because uh, you can go to rehab for Vicodin. You can't go to rehab for Dan Brown. <laughs> but that's awful. Like, that's so snobby and so elitist and so terrible. So maybe, just maybe, if I write it all out and I'm absolutely vicious and brutal about how terrible I am as a person, maybe I will move forward and get better. Wrong. <laughs> I'm, as, I'm as awful as ever. In fact, all that I actually learned from writing this book in terms of myself was that my snobbery has shifted as I've gotten over 30. Uh, and it's an interesting shift. So prior to turning 30, I took all of my snobbery energy and I put it into indie music. Just over, just an insane amount of work. It, like checking four blogs a day, like remixes. It was exhausting. Um, and that's where I put all of my, my, snobbery, my snobby energy. But then I noticed after 30 that all of that energy had sort of shifted from indie music uh, to food. And that's where my snobbery lies now. So rather than sort of judge you about not knowing about the newest bands, I judge you for not knowing about the newest restaurants, you know? I will judge your fridge before I judge your iPod now, you know? It's like, really? Himalayan sea salt? Come on, man. It's all about Hawaiian this season. You know that. You're better than this. And that was it. That was, that was the change, that I am now a food snob instead of an indie music snob. So welcome to your 30s. For those of you who are 29, it's coming. And, you know, I tried to figure out where... If I were to do another one, like, where would my snobbery shift? And I tried to think, I'm like, music, food, the only thing I could think of that I would have after this is if I had a child. Like, I can't imagine how obnoxious I would be if I had a child. And I think the only way I could be more obnoxious than if I had a child was if I had a dog. Because white people like their dogs more than their children. And so I just had so much fun writing this. It was just incredible to get to do it again. And I have um, a longer talk that I don't think I'm have time to get into today about it, it continues with a lot of the message that I had from the first one about the idea of race and class in America still being tied together. And it's, it's a very simple concept. And again, I don't go into it in any sort of serious depth. There are much better authors who do it, much smarter authors who do it. But in terms of at least making the point, at least getting people to understand that there is still a race and class issue, and they are tied together in the United States, the fact that the first book and this book exist, that I can make this list, just this list, it's just a list of completely ordinary things. And when you call them white, you instantly get that I'm talking about the upper middle class. And that in and of itself is, is a big enough message. And so I have a whole bunch of other things to say about that one, but not for today. <laughs> Instead, I want to tell you about all the other terrible things that have happened to me since starting this blog. <laughs> One of them is that, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, writing about race on the internet is interesting. Uh, for example, to give you an idea of what I mean by interesting, uh, the climate of race discussion online works somewhat like this. If you were to post a video of a giggling baby, like just a laughing, giggling baby, right? 30 seconds from your iPhone, because I know you all have iPhones. Um, 30 seconds, put it on YouTube. Comment number one, oh, what a cute baby. Comment number two, fuck that white baby. <laughs> Wait, four seconds. Every ethnic slur on earth, 3,000 comments, full-scale race war over a giggling baby. <laughs> Welcome to the internet. And so you can imagine the sort of stuff that happens when you actually write about race, even in the way that I'm writing about race. So I've had an email sent to the site, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, so forgive me, that said, dear asshole, always a good start, um, I hope you go to jail and get raped and get AIDS and die slowly so you can watch your entire family die of cancer. This was because I had the audacity to say white people liked yoga and expensive sandwiches. So you should try to get an idea of sort of where we stand on this climate about how much rage and anger is still out there. And what, what scares me a little bit, though, is I still get, you know, less grammatically correct, but probably nicer emails from people who are still furious at the site, and they're furious at the book, and they're furious at the concept. And what they're angry about is they always write in, and they're always just saying, you know what, man, this is so unfair. If you recycle stuff black people like, it would be racist. Yeah, of course it would be racist. I wrote stuff white people like, man. I'm a red-headed Canadian. I think I have the authority to write this book. And then they're like, yeah, okay, all right, 
bad example. But what I'm saying is it's so unfair, man. How come it's okay to make fun of white people? It's not okay for black people or make fun of Latinos or Asian people. This is unfair. This is bullshit double standard, man. This sucks. And they're legitimately angry at what they see as a double standard. And so I've got a million reasons why, but I believe that it is always, under every single circumstance, a good idea to make fun of white people. If you... <laughs> If you ever find yourself in a scenario where you're thinking, should I make fun of white people? Yes, always. No, liter literally nothing bad can come of it. Look, I got two books out of it. You know what I mean? Like, I strongly recommend making fun of white people in all social scenarios. And the reason why, and the reason why it's okay and why you can get away with it, uh, one second, is that as it stands now, there is currently no ethnic slur for white people, the kind that I'm talking about, that actually hurts. And here's what I mean by that. If you were to call a white person a honky or a cracker, we would love it. We'd be like, oh, is this what oppression feels like? Oh, call me, call me that again. Call me that again. Oh, we're like those priests, you know, that whip themselves, you know, to feel the suffering. We would adore it. And the reason why this doesn't exist, well, actually, no, there is one ethnic slur for white people. Uh, it's a pretty harsh one to call them. Um, I will tell you what it is in a second, but this is, this is really, you really gotta wanna hurt them for this one. So if you're in an argument and you just need the trump card, the one ethnic slur that will hurt white people, not just for a day, but for weeks, is if you call them average. That can literally ruin a white person's vacation. You know, like, a week and a half later, they'll be like, what did I, what did I do? <laughs> I, got, I, I gotta write him an email. Um, literally ruin it. But, but the reason why there's no real one that actually hurts is that where ethnic slurs and all of that comes from is it, it comes from history. And it comes from the, the pain of the past that has not been fixed. And the fact of the matter is that doesn't exist for white people. And this is why I say white people like to get history degrees. Because it always has a happy ending for them. <laughs> like, look, the potato famine, yeah, that was terrible. Don't get me wrong, but things are great now. You know what I mean? Like, all the potatoes we can eat, everything is fantastic. So for that reason, it is always, always, always okay to make fun of white people, and I strongly encourage it. So I have a couple readings from the new book, and then a closing statement, and we'll open it up to questions. Um, so Boston, congratulations, made the first page. Um, good job, and you know, there's a line drawing of a uh, Boston girl, uh, black stretch pants, which I believe are you're required by law to wear. Um, <laughs> New Balance shoes, a North Face jacket over a Harvard t-shirt, Democratic pins, Boston Red Sox hat. And I have never, ever been in a city where I've seen a stronger commitment to cardiovascular health than Boston. Like, look out, like, people, I saw people running, like, a lot of people running in this, and the rowing, and the, it's winter, man, like, put on the fat layers. This is what we do as humanity. Um, all right, so just a couple from here. Uh, number one, the Ivy League. The Ivy League is expensive, exclusive, and located in the Northeast, and has campuses featuring beautiful, actual ivy-covered buildings. All of these things are beloved by white people, so logically it would seem they all love the Ivy League, but this is not true. White people have a tortured relationship with the Ivy League, and if you broach the subject in the wrong way, you can offend or even anger a white person. But before getting into the more nuanced aspects of the subject, it's important to know that all white people believe they are intelligent enough and have the work ethic required to attend an Ivy League school. The only reason they didn't actually attend one is that they chose not to participate in the dog and pony show required to gain acceptance. White people also like to believe that they were not born into a privileged enough family to co for the coveted legacy admission. This should always be at the back of your mind as you discuss the Ivy League with a white person. Once you've determined that a white person did not attend an Ivy League school, you should try to give them an opportunity to explain why their school was actually a superior educational experience. <laughs> Some easy ways to do this, mention grade inflation, professors who value research over teaching, or high tuition costs. Any one of these will set a white person off on a multi-minute rant. When they've reached the end of their defense about why they chose the right school, you should say, yeah, you know, I knew a bunch of people who went to Harvard and none of them work as hard or as smart as you. This is a very effective technique for gaining acceptance among white people, since they need constant reassurance that they are smart and they made the right choice with their life. If you actually attended an Ivy League school, you will be seen as a threat. So prepare for a lot of questions from white people. They will constantly ask about how much work you had, the type of students at the school, the professors, your dorm room, your reading list, and they'll try to figure out your SAT score. <laughs> they desperately need a source of comparison so they can determine if you are actually smarter than them. In fact, the only way to stop this line of questioning is to imply that you only got in because of your minority status. Once you say that, white people will stop feeling threatened since they can now believe they too would have been accepted at an Ivy League school if only they were a minority. It also gives them a personal story about the effectiveness of affirmative action. 
White people also like to call their school the Harvard of the insert region or athletic conference. <laughs> Do not challenge this. It will ruin their confidence. <laughs> now, a uh, brief story about that. So I attended uh, McGill University. Um, I believe Harvard is the McGill of the South. <laughs> But we do actually say that, the Harvard of the North. How ridiculous is that? And someone, there was a comment exchange once on the site. And if you, if you have the, the strength to read the comments on stuff white people like, because it is a full-on race war in there, there's sometimes some amazingly funny stuff in there. So after I put this one up, someone wrote, I went to the Harvard of Design Schools. Does that mean I'm white? Comment underneath. No, it just means you're ruining your life. <laughs> Touché. Um, moving on, single malt scotch. There's no getting around the subject. White people love alcohol. From their refined taste in French wine to their fervent consumption of Maine's microbrews, booze makes up a very important part of white culture. But many white people soon realize there are only so many beers that one can drink, and being an expert on wine is almost impossible. Currently, the most realistic way for a white person to look like a wine expert is to look at a restaurant's wine list and then promptly order a bottle of cheap but not the cheapest bottle on the menu. Advanced white people pretend they recognize and enjoy this moderately priced bottle of wine. With beer snobbery mastered and wine snobbery all but abandoned, white people were forced to try to find a new alcohol for snobbishness. The process of elimination is a fairly simple procedure. First, any alcohol that's mentioned by a rapper is immediately cast aside. <laughs> not just the brands, but the alcohol itself. This is not because white people have any prejudice against rappers. Quite the opposite. In fact, their prejudice is simply against other white people who do what rappers tell them. Increased sales of Grey Goose, Patron, Hennessy, and Cristal have effectively erased any real opportunity for white people to participate in snobbery about each respective beverage. To a white person, there can be no greater shame than waiting in line at a liquor store and having a 20-year-old frat boy say to them, Oh, what, you're on that yak too? Uh, this is a Heine Triomphe, perhaps the world's finest. I'm on that Hennessy! <laughs> Even the possibility of this exchange has sent white people, especially white men, scrambling for an alcoholic beverage to set them apart from these wrong kinds of white people. What they found was single malt scotch. It has everything a white person could want. It's got European heritage, it's expensive, college-age white people avoid it, and perhaps most important, crotchety old white men love it. <laughs> this latter point is especially important, since you should understand that white people, for whatever reason, are generally inclined to like or force themselves to like anything that angry, intelligent old white men enjoy. <laughs> Sweaters, jazz, things made from wood, books. <laughs> books, records, and complaining about how everything is terrible. <laughs> Like, I actually, I'm so guilty of that. I love everything that angry old white men love. Uh, one of the worst, exper scariest experiences of my life was I was, uh, I was at a gun range uh, with my friend. He's Republican. He was showing me how to shoot. It was horrible. I, I freaked out. Like, the gun jammed. I thought it was going to explode. It was a bad experience. But next to me, there was this old guy, and he was, like, really wiry and thin. He had an awesome plaid shirt, like, a million times more awesome than this. And these... <laughs> And these incredible old glasses, right? Like they were vintage and incredible and amazing. And he was shooting some very large guns. And then he had literally a bag of more guns next to him. <laughs> and like my white person conflict was like, I want to know where this guy got his glasses, but yeah, I'm probably going <laughs> to, I'm not going to ask. So I avoided it at that time, but it's still to this day, they were like, they were amazing. I and mean, they were just incredible, but I didn't get shot. So that's a plus. <laughs> Uh, the last one I'm going to read and then have a final statement is um, complaining about the death of print media. <laughs> White people are expert complainers. Witness the events that transpire after they're served a dish they didn't order in a restaurant. But that type of complaining is done by all people. No, what white people are best at is complaining, uh, is complaining without being able to actually do anything about the problem. See Conan O'Brien, Iran, oil spills, air pollution, tuna depletion, and any other problem that would require them to make a sacrifice of time, money, or sushi dining experiences. <laughs> But in recent years, the biggest issue that has been bugging white people to the point of complaint, but not action, has been the death of print media. Bring up any newspaper and white people begin saying how they fear a world with no daily newspaper, and that we will all suffer as professional journalists wither away and replaced with silly blogs that have no importance. <laughs> this love of the print media comes from two places. The first is that all white people like to believe that they spend the majority of their news-consuming time reading stories that matter and make a difference. Whether this is true is irrelevant. But it's a good way to appear smart to white people. Say something like, I can't believe no one's getting upset about what the city government's doing right now. It's like no one read that amazing piece in the paper. The white person will simply agree with you and respect your news acumen. <laughs> Second, white people fear the death of print media because deep down, all white people want to believe that it's possible to make a living as a freelance writer. 
Of course, this is perhaps the biggest lie in white culture, pushing out such favorites as, I'm going to write a novel, and I'll be fine for retirement if I start saving when I'm 40. <laughs> of course, when you ask the white person if they actually subscribe to a daily newspaper, they'll say they get the Sunday New York Times, which is a bit like saying you sponsor a child in Africa, but only give them enough money to eat on Sunday. <laughs> this is what we like. So th that's sort of, you know, the, the book continues and more of the same. But in addition to some of the things the book says about race and class, there, there is a serious thing that I want to talk about. So obviously, you can tell from, from how I look and what I write about, I'm, I'm very much a left-wing liberal. That I'm Canadian. I didn't have a choice. <laughs> but the truth is, we are, we are in a very important struggle for the country right now. And the fact of the matter is that what we want for the country, health care, help for the poor, all of these things are good and they're right. And we should have these things. But the problem is our attitude, our smugness is getting in the way. And ultimately, we feel as though to convince these people of the right thing to do, we end up convincing ourselves. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to health care or when it comes to poverty reform or anything like that, we don't have to convince Portland, Oregon that we're right. We have to convince the Tea Party that we're right. And when we show up in our Prius with a coexist bumper sticker on the back and look down at them, they see us for what we are, which is condescending yuppies. And so what I would hope is that we can, you know, see what I'm making fun of here and take a second and stop patting ourselves on the back for a minute to actually sort of talk with people and be open-minded. Because the truth is we're fairly closed-minded when it comes to people who don't agree with us. We're open-minded when it comes to food and all sorts of wonderful things, but when it comes to people who don't agree with us, we're very, very closed-minded. So if we could all just work together to just open our minds a little bit and just listen, to actually listen and not be so condescending, I think we could actually make a real difference. I mean, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> it's too late for me. Um, but it would be fantastic if you guys could, because... Um, yeah, because ultimately when Sarah Palin wins in 2012, I can go back to Canada. Um, you guys are all welcome to come with me. Anyways, thank you guys very much. I, I thought a long time ago that I'd run out of material for white people, but, you know, I just keep going to farmer's markets and independent coffee shops, and I keep overhearing conversations, and so there's more and more stuff. So I, I really don't know if I'm going to be able to, but, um, but if I can, yeah, it'd be great. I'll give, I'll give it a shot but I think I might have to take a backpacking trip through Europe and then uh, <laughs> just to refresh my, you know, my, uh, my senses. Uh, you know, it's, it's fun to get what to do, to do what I do. And um, I don't really do all that much. I don't ever forget that. But the fact of the matter is that I've had a lot of TAs and professors say that the book and the blog are actually a great starting point for them to get into a serious discussion about race and class. And so that's the closest thing I'm doing. I mean, I'm not really doing it myself. I'm just still being a smug, arrogant, annoying Canadian. But someone else is, is doing something great with it. So that's what I'm really doing for racism. I hope that helped in answering your question. Uh, March 31st, 2008, the day I got the book deal. It was, um, I know a lot of college students are getting very, the day of. Um, I should have been fired though at that point. Like I'd spent all this time doing interviews and like I was checked out. So um, I know a lot of college students are excited about getting your first job, but quitting your first job is a loss. <laughs> so um, so I, qu I quit that job. Um, I, I had to. And actually, I ended up getting the job that I dreamt about having my entire life for the last. Um, seven, eight months now. I've been working as a TV writer for a show for MTV that's coming out in the fall. Um, it's been it's been amazing. It's been a, a dream come true. So, but it's more hours than I've ever worked in my life. But it's been it's been awesome. Let's see. There's there's a few things. First of all, um, if you try, I mean, when you create a site, if you create a site with the idea that this is going to get big, this is going to be huge, not going to happen, right? You honestly, everybody I know has had a site get really popular, and I actually know a fair amount thanks to there's another conference held around here every couple of years called RaffleCon which is amazing, the best conference ever. If you have a chance to go, it's awesome. And I've met a lot of people who've had things go get really popular, you know, text from last night and all this sort of stuff. No one started with an idea that it was going to get big because the truth is you don't know that your site is going to be big. And if you start doing something and you're writing to what you think is a perceived audience, you end up talking down to them and it ends up not working. And the ultimate thing is if you're doing a site like that, then every time someone looks at the site, you're saying, forward this on, make me successful, do the work for me. And that doesn't work. So what you've got to do is create something that's great, whatever it is, and hope that people find it so great that they can't resist forwarding it on and it'll grow from there. It's much harder, you know, it's easier to said than done. Like, I, I have no idea how to do it again. So you've just got to keep trying. And I think ultimately the best advice, though, is if you, if you blog and you write because you love it, take that as its own reward and then see what happens. That's the best advice I can possibly get because I literally, I didn't follow any special technique. I just wrote it and put it out there and people found it and it exploded. That was it. And that's the same story over and over again for everyone's had it happen, except for the people who wrote This Is Why You're Fat. 
they called their shot and they made it. So you got to give them a lot of respect for that. And there's a guy named Jonah Peretti who runs BuzzFeed, and he's the best in the world at that. It's un- his talent for that is unbelievable. So if you have that ability, go for it. You'll be a hero to everyone, but it's, it's really hard. You just got to put it out there and hope for the best. Oh, the hippie commie. Also, you said about three times in that. And as a Canadian, I'm always watching out for it. Um, <laughs> Just it's one of our weaknesses as a people. Uh, they, of course, I mean, the hippie commune is like, look, it's, it's still about privilege. It's about choosing to drop out and do this. You know what I mean? Like in, in other countries where you have people, you know, living off the land, subsisting, you know, just barely enough to get by and eat. That's called poverty, right? Like that's it. That, whereas with, in white culture, it's called being a hippie. Like it's a choice. And so there's fundamentally a luxury involved with it. Um, so, yeah, that's that's I'd say is, is, is the difference. Yeah. White Americans don't have their Canadian passports yet. <laughs> That's it. I mean, the funny thing is, the more I've traveled, white people are literally, literally the same everywhere, right? Like, you know, you substitute a few sports things here and there, but we're pretty much exactly the same people everywhere you go. And I think that we're, it's very strange because we're getting into, you know, it's like, this is, this is like, you know, Francis Fukuyama, like the end of whiteness. Like, this is, where do we go from here, right? And we don't know. Like, we're not going to become Republicans. You know what I mean? And so... But we're all the same. The way the world's been connected now, white people in Europe, white people in Australia, white people in Canada, they're all sort of the same people. And it's, it's, un- it's been unbelievable to me to see how much of this translates to these, you know, to like Australia. I've never been to Australia before and I get there and like, oh yeah, this is, all, this is me and all my friends. And I'm like, wow, all right, good job. But we're all exactly the same, so don't even worry about it. <laughs> so if you move, you'll fit right in. Nothing, nothing to worry about. Like, I, it, it would be interesting to see, but it's going to depend on, like, pretty much an uh, equal distribution of, of resources across all races. And I don't think that we're headed down a path where that's going to happen. I mean, we're basically heading towards a, a resource war with, you know, a, a, where race is going to make a huge difference. You know, we're looking at, you know, uh, Canadian resources, obviously, predominantly a white country, you know, China, Africa. I mean, there, there's still going to be race-based issues coming all the way through. So until the resources are spread out evenly, I don't think there's any way we can do that. And I have no idea how we'd ever get to that point. It is going to come down to economy. And the fact of the matter is that the racism of the past still plays itself out today. You know what I mean? In, ter- in terms of, uh, of wealth distribution, in terms of just about everything. And so until all of that can be wiped clean, I don't really see an end to it. That would be, that would be my guess. But yeah, that's where the humor comes from. The humor is like all of this stuff is as white people. You can sell to us. <laughs> this few- okay, that's the, the email I get all the time where people write in, they're like, I can't tell if you're trying to be funny or not. And I hate that more than anything because I'm like, come on, man. I, if you don't think I'm funny, that's fine. But you can't even tell that I'm trying. Like, come on. <laughs> but, but, what, but what I'm writing about, what, what the criticism of is all of these things where the humor comes from is that it's, it's ultimately everything's self-congratulatory, right? Like, we, not only do we need the markers for ourselves to say, look at me, I'm progressive. Look at me, I'm not racist. We need outward things that show other people that, right? Coexist bumper stickers, you know what I mean? Like, things that just tell other people, hey, hey, that's not a racist guy right there. Oh, probably, you know, 4,000 years of unchecked prosperity is probably what we're trying to cover up. Um, you know, and the, and the blood of thousands on our hands and things like that. So, yeah, that's probably what we're trying to cover up. But I think, you know, Prius gets 50 miles to a gallon. That should cover mo- most of it, right? Well, I, those, those issues are directly about race, period. And I think, but what it says about the class is that in spite of, you know, in spite of what we want to believe about the opportunity for others to join this class, especially the upper middle class, there are still very, very real, very strong barriers that are there. And I think both of those things were, were evidence of that. And so especially the, the, the class that I write about it believes itself and probably is the, the most progressive class, you know, in history in terms of, you know, ideas and wealth redistribution, and everything like that. But at the same time, these issues are still there. And I think both of those are strong reminders that, that, that before we get into all the issues of class, the issue of race is still there. So that's, that's what I'd say on those ones. So I'm just, I'm just a staff writer. I didn't, I didn't create this TV show. Uh, it's called Good Vibes. It's just like a goofy high school animated show. And it was created by David Gordon Green, who did Pineapple Express and that movie, Your Highness. And uh, Adam Brody's a voice, and Tony Hale from Arrested Development, and Danny McBride from Eastbound and Down plays the uh, female sex ed teacher. <laughs> so yeah, it should. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Anybody else? All right. Now, if you have questions about white people that you're embarrassed to ask in public. Um, <laughs> I am more than happy to answer them at the front of the room. Also, if for whatever reason you want to take a picture with me, I just ask that you let me hold the book up. Otherwise, people will see the photo and be like, hey, you met Seth Rogen. (laughs) Um, Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out.